Okay, my wonderful students, let's begin uh, the remainder of lecture. Uh, we're going to actually t talk a little bit about chapter 20 today when we talk about capacitors. And we'll talk about chapter 20 circuitry things tomorrow and then Thursday for half the class, you know, like 45 minutes or so. Um, we have a few items of housekeeping to um, discuss. Uh, miscellaneous comments about homework uh, number one, the idealized molecule. Uh, and I'm speaking only of the papers that I graded, although I'm guessing that our um, Greater Daniel Reinhardt probably found similar uh, issues. Uh, first of all, uh, nobody in my pile of scantrons scored 15 out of 15. Um, we had some 14s, but we didn't have any 15s, straight 15. So uh, some of the common errors, and you might want to make a note of this, uh, I on about nine million papers, I wrote minus one for not using two significant figures, which you should have done on your final answers anyways. Um, and so for the, the tilt angle and the net force, um, some of you had either a poor sketch or no sketch at all for the net force. Some of you made it wider than it is tall, which, okay, and I, I made a note of this on some of your papers, I don't expect you all to be Leonardo da Vinci Jr. as for making cool diagrams um, and ultra precise and stuff. But on this one, you're, um, the, you know, like the rectangle or the, the right triangle used for the net force, it should have been taller than it was wide because the horizontal component of the net force from the charge out on the x-axis was smaller. And the vertical component of the net force from the charge up on the y-axis um, was uh, a bigger charge. Uh, the vector, the net force vector was aimed northwest for many, many, many of you. And okay, you can get the right magnitude, but you do not get the right direction with that. And I think what a lot of you guys were thinking was, okay, the, the three uh, points in question formed uh, like the letter L, and you just crossed it and made a, a right triangle out of it, which gives you the right angles and stuff, but that is not the right uh, triangle for the net force. The net force should have been going northeast because there's no pull um, there's no push on the electron to the left. There's only a pull to the right and a pull north. So it should have been a northeastern directed vector. Uh, so you can read the talking PDF, which has been up since Thursday uh, evening. Uh, if you haven't already, you can look at and listen to my description of the solution. Okay, another thing that I want to mention to you is today is the first day of uh, official clicking. So if you don't have your, and I know there's a couple that don't, um, if you don't have your clicker uh, ready to roll today, uh, now it's going to start affecting your semester grade. Now, just so you know, uh, there is a little bit of uh, leeway in the clicking. Let me turn the sound down just a little bit. There is a little bit of leeway in the clicking because to get full pointage, 25 out of 25, you only have to answer 85% of the questions, not 100%. Now, and that only, um, I'm only asking if you have them answered, not if you have them correct. It's participation. Uh, so 85% means that you can, you know, like I was talking to a student before class doesn't have the clicker yet. And if the student that I was talking to before class gets it for tomorrow, she'll probably still be able to get 100% on the 25 out of 25, 
All right. So it's, you've got like maybe in the summer, I, w I would like to say two, but probably realistically more like one lecture to burn before it starts to impact your semester grade. So just keep that in mind. The other thing that we do, and, and, and you'll see this as soon as I start posting pointage roundups, uh, probably next week, uh, I keep track of how many you actually answer correctly. And my um, procedure for that, and my reason for that is, I like to reward students that um, do 75% correct, that's a B, I give them four bonus points on a 250. So that's like a little bit more than 1%. And you know what? Sometimes that four points is just what you need to, to slide over the borderline. You know, and I like to do that. I like to give you guys breaks. I mean, I like to grade tough. I mean, if you look at your, you know, your homework, those of you MNOP, you know that I was pretty, pretty mean with some of the grading. Uh, but I do like to give you guys rewards for working hard. Uh, oh, by the way, one more thing about those homeworks. Um, I posted a, a, a column. A column in my grade book is a row in your grades page. And it says 10.15 points, I believe. Okay, now that's to signify that for... People that are graded by me, they get 15 points. People that are graded by Daniel, they get 10 points. And I'll do that every time. Now, if you uh, submit all five written homeworks this semester, you'll all have a shot at 55 points for 10-point specials and one 15-point special that I grade. Okay? Uh, but I have to put everybody's grades in one column, so it says 10.15. Uh, there was one other thing I was going to say. Oh, um, for those of you that uh, got up to the front a little bit late after I called your name, uh, we'll catch you at the end of class. Hopefully we'll be able to dismiss a few minutes early and get you. We only got a few up here, so we'll get you. And when, you know, when we're handing out papers and exams and stuff, handing them back, you got, you got to get yourself up here, F-A-S-T. Because we only go through this this stack of papers once, you know we're just not going to hang around until absolutely everybody finds the time to get their you know what up here. Any questions? Any questions? Yes. Um, no, you read the data that you have and figure out. On that one, you had the distances 2.5. You had uh, the charge on the electron to like seven digits, but the d two distances were two significant figures. So you, I always carry all my digits until the very end, okay? And so then I go, okay, better. I calculate it all with, you know, four or five digits or whatever, but then I, I make a decision two significant figures, or whatever the case may be. So the given information will tell you. Okay, okay. question in the back. Um, so if you were grade 7 today, how high would you give your grade 10? That's correct. I gave him a two. A two uh, he, he graded the bottom line, you know, the net force and then the, the magnitude of the net force and then the, uh, the angle. So you could get a 10, a 5, or a zip. All right. Uh, oh, you know what? I was going to, I've been thinking, a bunch of you have been asking about office hours. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to have office hours tomorrow, Java City, in the library, so right up the sidewalk here. And if you can, and I'm gonna, and, and the time is gonna be a little bit uh, floaty. In other words, I'm only going to say after lunch and finish before class. So I might decide to, to dismiss everybody at quarter to three because I still have a little bit of work to do or something like that. But it'll be after lunch, so 12.30, 12.15, 12.45, somewhere in there. 
until uh, 2.30, 2.15, 2.45, somewhere in there, all right? And that'll be tomorrow. And what I want you to do, if you can get to Java City early and get a booth, then things will go nicely. Because the booth is, but notice there's always somebody in there. All right. So if you get there early and get a booth for Dr. B, then we'll have, we'll have, not, otherwise you got to sit in those stupid chairs and stuff, which, yeah, you can do it, but it's a pain in the neck. Anyway, so try, if you're, if you're there, try, and if, and I'm going to go right back to the booths, and if I don't recognize you, just go, hey, Dr. B, I got a booth for you, okay? You'll see me wandering around in there, all right? So we'll, and just so you know, the office hours, shh, 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 you bring this, the agenda, whatever you want to talk about. So if you want to talk about the price of tomatoes in China, yeah, okay, I guess we can talk about that. But usually you'll want to talk about lecture notes or homework or something. Okay, and that's whatever you want. So, um, and the other thing is, uh, th there's 200 of you, and it won't be 200, but it might be 10. And so you're, we're just going to take turns, you know, like in kindergarten, you know, you take turns. And uh, everybody gets, hopefully everybody gets a chance to ask a question. Now, the other thing is, um, just drop in. If you can only make it for 15 minutes and you just feel like listening, that's fine. So if you can't, you, if you, if you can make it at one until 120 and then you got to blaze out and do something, that's fine. All right. So just drop in. Um, and if you get there early, just get a snag a booth and that, and you'll be on the top of my list for the day. All right. Now, I have another subject that has been driving me bonanza, and that is Wiley Plus. I believe that we will prevail, and we are prevailing, and I know that a bunch of yous Got your homework done Saturday, uh, all three of them. That's good. Um, there's another one going to start running at 5 o'clock tonight. And uh, however, uh, one of the students, I don't know where she is, but uh, yeah. Yeah, but it wasn't just you. It was, I was thinking about somebody else. The grades are apparently the grades... Well, see, here's, here's, what, here's what I can see. I can see the grade book. Apparently, there's no way for you guys to see your grades once you've done the assignment. Uh, or, or is there? I don't know. I mean, could somebody start a discussion thread and just tell how to do it then? Because I don't, I don't know how to do the student side of that. Anyway. Now, this is from... This is from Saturday morning, all right, 9.32 p No, that's Saturday night, 9.32 p.m. And uh, it shows students a bunch like, like this one. Get my cursor over here. One of the students uh, right here, they have everything done. But... Um, some of you reported that you have done all the assignments and, in fact, gotten full points on each one, but it doesn't show up in web courses. All right, now I'm aware of that. I have asked the Wiley, two of the system administrators at Wiley Plus to explain why the grades don't synchronize more rapidly. But, you know, uh, I also noticed, I don't know who it was that I was talking to, but I also noticed somebody complaining about it f Saturday, but then yesterday, Sunday, I looked at it, and I said, ooh, that student's got another grade posted. So it's proceeding. It looks like it's dribs and drabs, but I have no idea what their procedure is, but I'm trying to find out. 
But in any case, um, I got it. I mean, we, you know, all this stuff, I mean, you know, here's this student here, the student, you know, four out of four, cinco out of cinco. You know, so I got all your stuff. Don't worry about that. It's in there. Okay. All right. So, but it's not showing up in uh, web courses very rapidly. So we're going to try to deal with that. So my guess is that you're going to have to develop uh, a spirit of forgiveness toward Wiley Plus. And that's what I'm going to try to do because otherwise I'm going to go mental. I'm going to lose my so-called mind. All right. Now this, this is awesome. I can look at what you selected for every single attempt. Now this, this is a random student, a different one. And look at this. On this problem, number 45, they took three times before they got it right. I can see what they did. You know, it's pretty nice. So there's all kinds of stuff in there. Um, it's, it's just really detailed, but we still have some uh, questions about how it all works, especially how it synchronizes into web courses. But we'll get that sorted out. Hopefully, I was hoping to have something by lecture time today, but they're kind of, I don't know, they're still eating donuts over there at Wiley Plus. Still drinking coffee. All right, now I want to talk about some physics stuff. Uh, hold on a second. I see I blooped up my slide here. Let me get my cursor over here. Um, yeah, so now we're going to talk about chapter 19. And chapter 18 was basically about the electric field and various properties. The electric field is a vector, and it's an abstraction of a force. Now we're going to talk about abstractions of energy concepts in chapter uh, 19, and then we're going to apply it to circuits in chapter 20. And actually, we're going to do a bunch of stuff with circuits. Now, so let's just do a little review of what energy and work is. Work is, a f is the result of a force applied along a displacement, kind of like this little, this little weeder dog chasing a rhinoceros. Okay, um, So the work done is along the vector displacement delta x by a force. So if the force is perpendicular to the displacement, you don't get any work done. You may change the direction, but you won't change the kinetic energy. So that's defined as, the, as W, the work. Now remember, the definition of work is the change in the kinetic energy, either negative for something slowing down or positive for something speeding up. Okay. A positive uh, work, a positive amount of work done if the force and displacement are parallel, same directions. If you're, if you're moving to the right and the force is to the right, the force is going to accelerate you to a higher speed, therefore higher kinetic energy. So the change in the kinetic energy is going to be positive. You're going to have more joules of kinetic energy. On the other hand, if, if you're moving to the right, but the force is to the left, the force is going to st start taking away your velocity. It's going to slow you down. Okay, It's going to decelerate you, and that means less kinetic energy. So um, smaller minus bigger means negative You know, for delta Ke. It's always final minus initial, later minus earlier. Okay, so for... Um, for uh, force in the opposite direction to the displacement, yeah, you're losing kinetic energy and speed, so the work is negatory. Now, this also applies to the inverse R squared force. The Coulomb force is a force. Newtons, nice. It moves charges around, nice. Charges have mass, nice. Charges have velocity if they're moving, nice. Therefore, they have kinetic energy. If they're subject to a force, they're going to change their kinetic energy they're, and maybe change direction, okay? And you had some, uh, I, I think you had like one brain teaser for homework 
about the you know what a charged particle does between parallel plates. So um, in the Coulomb force, what we're going to do is think of a spherical um, symmetry. You know, just for a very simple example. So we're going to think of a point charge, the electric field, and the electric force. They're either radially outward from a positive charge or radially inward. And we're going to orient our displacement uh, so that it's radial. In other words, we're not going to change latitude or longitude. We're either going to go straight in towards the center or straight away from the center because that's the only thing that changes the size of the force. Okay, so what you do is you, you uh, figure out F delta R, delta R being the change in the radial coordinate, and then you add, all up the, you add up all the F delta R's. The reason you have to add up a bunch of F delta R's is the F is changing with R. So when you change radius, to change the radial position, the distance away from your central charge array, um, the force is getting smaller or bigger. Okay, so you have to recompute. So you make tiny steps, calculate F delta R, and then add it to your sum. Okay, and you get the work from that, the work done by the field, and then the opposite of that is the electrostatic potential energy. And I believe the textbook and also your instructor, me, uh, we both use the symbol EPE for electrostatic potential energy. All right. And uh, that's the main thing that we're talking about. Now, here's, you know, this thing's all discombobulated. Sorry. I was, I was supposed to move the, the rhino out of the way there, but... Uh, anyways, you can see here, here's the central charge, E. And uh, right out here, this little, let me get my cursor out here. Okay, here's a little delta R. And the two dashed circles, they're just two different uh, circles of two different radii. So that if you go straight from one circle out to the next, that's a delta R. So you could put your delta R out there. All right. And if you have a positive chest charge like that one, then you can think about, you know, uh, for a delta R outward or a delta R inward, how does the kinetic energy change? How does the potential energy change? All right now, what we're going to do is think our way through uh, to get a, um, a good handle on the potential energy. And this is going to be a little bit different from what you'll read in the textbook. All right, so I offer it to you as my version of generating the idea of electrostatic potential energy for a point charge, which the textbook, they don't even do it. Okay, but we're going to do it. It's fairly simple. Uh, but before we do that, let's do some clicking because I have some questions for you, and I want you to, on clicking, I want you to read carefully and think. On exams, Thursday, midterm exam number one, I especially want you to read carefully and think. All right, so turn on your clicker, get the Go Nitro message, and let's go. All right, now here's my array. Central charge is an electron, negatory. So let's say that your delta R is negative. Is it parallel to the electric force on the red positive test charge? Yes or no? And if yes, why? If no, why? So read carefully and decide. Make a decision. Why are you taking a photo of that? It's going to be in YouTube. I see students doing that all the time. Oh, let me start the question. Sorry. Sitting here waiting for you guys. Okay. Uh, uh, frequency DD. Okay, you should be able to get a Go Nitro and start clicking in your questions. Okay. 
And remember, it's I encourage you to talk and discuss as you work your way through these clicker questions. Exam day, no, you got to keep your your mouth zipped. You got to zip and zap on exam day. Rhea, was my explanation about, uh, was it adequate about, where's Rhea? Yeah, okay, there you are, okay. Hey, was it good? Okay. All those of you guys that mailed me messages today, I wrote a very brief reply to all of you because I knew that I was going to be discussing that in, in lecture. Okay, 20 seconds to vote. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Uh, let's see what you guys voted for. Yeah, pretty good. Uh, most of you, majority voted for that. Yeah, so delta R is negative. Okay, that means it's going from high to low. So remember delta R, here's the, here's the definition. Delta R is R final minus R initial. So if your final is, is uh, smaller than your initial, uh, then you have a, um, a negative delta R. And for this one, the, the electric field and the electric force points towards the electron in the middle. And that is because, as we mentioned before, the positive test charge tells you what any positive charge would do. Uh, so I didn't, I didn't specify anything uh, about that red positive test charge. I just said it's a positive test charge. And we, and we use that to think with. Next question. Say that R, delta R is negatory. Okay, so same, same trajectory. Go ahead and vote. Is it yes, is it no? I love it. I love seeing you guys thinking and discussing. You know, pointing at the diagram and except for some of you I guess are messing around in Facebook or whatever, but Okay, 20 seconds. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Come on, you guys, eighty seven. Come on, one more. Okay, I give you a shot. No chances. All right, let's see what you guys voted for. Sweet. Yeah, so most of you got this one right. 
Yeah, so it's speeding up because a positive test charge is going to get attracted towards the, the electron. That means, you know, if it's at least if it starts from rest, it's going to it's going to gain velocity. Okay. Uh, now we'll do some more clicking in a few minutes, but before we do that, I want to show you uh, a spreadsheet. Uh, but before I show you my spreadsheet, we have some questions. Go ahead. It's Alicia, right? Yeah. Tatia. Okay, I was close. Okay. <laughs> do you remember your question? No, it doesn't. Because it the for work, you have to decide you know, the direction of the displacement and the direction of the force. If they're opposite, then yes, you'll have negative work because it's slowing down. But for this one, the force is not, is not outward. The positive test charge gets forced inward. So they're both in the same direction. So positive. Uh, Jade. Well, it's pointing towards the center in this diagram. Yeah, due west. Yeah. So d negative delta R points this way. If I'd said positive delta R, that would be sending it out to bigger R's. That would be due east in this diagram. So if it was on the other side. Yeah. Then you have to. Yeah. If it, if if you had a negative delta R on the left side here, that would be pointing due east. Okay. So you just have to mentally. You have to mentally. That's why I put in those circles, because the R values on each circle are all the same. So you're de and, and if I say that you have a delta R for your path increment, that means you're either inward or outward along like a spike, a uh, spoke of a wheel from one circle to the next circle, whether it's inward or outward. Okay. No, uh, yeah, that's right. But the electric field and the electric force are both pointing in the same direction. Yeah, so it's like getting, it's like somebody uh, giving you a boost, you know. You know, like if you're, if, if, you, if you remember when you were a little kid and you're trying to learn how to ride a bike and your, your parents, you know, they, they push you, Give you a little bit of a push, hopefully not too much, and get up to speed, and then you can then you can ride. All right. Now I want to talk about spreadsheets of forces. Don't bother copying this down, but do look at it. All right, and I'll just give you a little tour of this spreadsheet because this is the spreadsheet that's that generated some of the graphics you'll see in a minute. Um, I just set up a bunch of. Um, different R values. Let me get my cursor. Here's my R values over here. So, and these are in um, nanometers. So my first R value is 0 0.1 nanometers, 0 0.2 and stuff. And I chose um, an electron and a proton. Um, and so I was able to figure out the force, okay? You know, K times E squared. Matter of fact, here's K times E squared. Here's E, here's K, and then here's the product of K with E squared down here in scientific notation. And that's in Newton meters squared. All right, and here's my factor for nanometers. K, one times 10 to the minus nine. Okay, so I figure out my force, and then I multiply uh, the force uh, times delta um, delta R, which is, is always 0.1 nanometers. So this first one is, so here's F, and then um, notice that this is uh, 10 to the minus 10 times smaller, and it's negative. They're both negative, because the uh, positive uh, test charge 
is coming in uh, to the left, smaller, smaller values of R. Okay, and I calculate F delta R for each new increment, and notice that they get smaller and smaller. Okay, or actually, I think they get bigger and bigger. Yeah, no, they get smaller and smaller. Okay, and then here's, here's the sum of all of them, and it's actually the negative of the sum of all the F delta R's. And the reason I use that is because I'm going to use um, F delta R to calculate the electrical potential energy, the EPE. All right, so this is a, and you know, you can do this yourself. You know how to do it. If you know how to do any spreadsheet activity, you can do this and set it up. And um, for those of you that have had calculus class, this is numerical integration. This is doing the integral of F delta R or F D R um, on a computer numerically. Okay, so here's my, this is the most important column. We add these up and then I'm gonna graph up this, I'm gonna graph up the force and I'm gonna graph up the energy over here. All right, so let's take a look at the force. Here it is. Notice it's, here's zero up here at the top. And so the force is negative and it gets really negative in here. Uh, and what that means is it being negative, that means it's inward, okay? And being deep in the negatives means it's getting really, really strong because it's getting really, really close, okay? at smaller and smaller radius. Okay, and here's down here on the, the horizontal axis is the radius in nanometers. So this is the force. So out here, you know, once you get a few nanometers away, yeah, it's kind of, it's, it's, it's up there, but it's, it's not doing much. The big change is right in here. Okay, and that's the same for, that's an inverse R squared force. Okay, inverse R squared force gets really strong with smaller R, and it gets weaker with bigger R, all right? So no big surprises there, all right? So this is the F column, the force column. I just graphed it up. You know, I did my spreadsheet. It's about 20 points. Now, here's the EPE. This is the work, all right? Now, these are positives, and this one you can see it's dipping down and it it gets bigger and it, it kind of opens up here. Now here's the formula for electrostatic potential energy. Go ahead and write this down. And guess what it looks like? I mean this is after doing some calculus but it's basically this thing. This is a 1 over r curve. This is not 1 over r squared. The other one was 1 over r squared. This one's 1 over r. Okay, big difference. And in calculus, you know why that is. But anyways, here's a graph of it. It is 1 over R. And uh, that's the potential energy um, of an electron. So if you're a proton and you're out here at large values of R, what do things like to do? They like to go to the, a region of lower potential energy. They like to roll downhill. Okay. And this is not gravity, but it is kind of a, you know, lower potential energy. So if you put, if you had a, you know, uh, a proton out here at 2.25 nanometers, yeah, it would want to go down this hill. And it would start going faster and faster as it got to this really steep part. All right. So that's the formula for the electrostatic potential uh, energy uh, of an electron. And this up here, this should be electrostatic potential energy up here in the caption. And this is right here, EPE and so forth. Okay, now questions about this before I continue? Yes? Everything likes to go from lower potential energy to high, from higher potential energy to lower potential energy. Electrons too. But see now, this won't be the, the, um, this won't be the electrical potential energy if I had an electron out there, all right? If I had an electron out there, that, that'd bring a minus sign in here instead of a plus sign for a proton, and this, this thing would flip-flop. 
All right, and so what the, ele the electron would do is it would try to move away. And so the down, for an, for an electron, we would have to graph up a different curve for an electron. And it would be moving towards lower potential energy. The, it wouldn't be this curve. It would be kind of like a flip-flop of this because the electron is negatory. Okay, so um, now we're going to do an abstraction here just as we did with the force abstracting to the electric field. We're going to do another abstraction here, but first a question with the baseball hat. Yeah, but I'm not talking about low potential. I'm talking about low potential energy. There is a difference, my wonderful student, and let us get to it. As we did with the, the Coulomb force and extracted the electric field from, or abstracted the electric field for it, so we are also going to do um, an abstraction from EPE to voltage, or as we say, from EPE to electrostatic potential. And that is what you're reading about, okay? Electrostatic potential, electrons like to go to high values of, of electrostatic potential. Protons like to move away from high values of electrostatic potential. And this is one of the cool things about it. Now look at this, very simple. V equals KQ over R. So if you have a, and this is for a point charge. If you have a, a dipole or a set of other charges, you know you'd have a little bit more algebra and stuff in there. But this is, this is the most simple, okay? And we're gonna do the electrostatic potential uh, after the break for uh, parallel plates. But let's, so electrostatic potential or voltage is the analog um, of energy in the electric field, just as electric field is the analog of electric force around a charge array, okay? And the reason for this is that, as I mentioned before, this sets up, a, and this is a scalar, it's not a vector. So it's really easy to work with. All the calculus and fancy footwork you gotta do with elect fancy electromagnetic fields is simpler because this is a scalar. It's a very simple, and anyways, for, for this, for a point charge, it's fairly simple. And every fancy uh, electrical array is, is basically made up of point charges. So you're basically adding up a zillion of these things and you know that's where the calculus comes in. But as a point charge particle, yeah, that's it. And notice that I haven't specified electron or proton here. The SIGN of the charge is encoded in the symbol Q. So when I put a, an actual number of coulombs in there, I would have to put in you know minus 1.3 coulombs or it'd have to put in positive 2.7 coulombs or whatever you know, the charge value was. All right, a couple uh, specs uh, about electrical potential energy and the electrostatic potential. Um, electrostatic potential is energy per unit charge, just as electric field was newtons per unit charge, newtons per coulomb. A volt is one joule per coulomb. All right, so a volt is a unit of um, electrostatic potential on the household scale. So a coulomb of charge is a lot of charge, but it's, it's uh, something that we can make in, you know, in everyday life. Same with a joule. Okay, so a volt is an everyday scale unit, but there are other units of potential that you can look up. Some of them are less common. You know, there's a fancy one made up by a guy over in England. 
um, that in very special circumstances is useful. Um, now, uh, the change in the electrostatic potential, delta V, and this is capital V, the, which is the symbol that your textbook uses. Actually, I think the, yeah, the textbook uses capital V for the potential, V for voltage. Uh, it's reversible in that uh, protons like to go to lower values of potential. So they like a, a negative delta V. But electrons and young man with the blue baseball hat. Yeah, what is your first name again? Arthur. Uh, Mr. Arthur. The ele this is what you were asking about. Electrons like to go to higher values of the voltage. Because for that, because remember, the Coulomb interaction is is can repel or attract. So if you have a positive charge, the electron is going to go towards that. Okay, it wants to go towards that, and but in terms of the definition of potential, kq over r, that's where, that's really really high positive values. So a proton's not want to not going to want to go in that direction, but an electron definitely likes to go in that direction. So you got to remember, you know, it, you look at the potential. Where is it higher? Where is it lower? And then think, well, now what's moving? Electrons or protons? Positive ions or negative ions? And then decide which direction it's going to go. Jade. Yeah, KQ over R, everything in there is positive. And when R gets small, KQ over R gets ginormous. So it's going to go this way, close to, the, to R equals zero. Now, if, if, if you have an electron, Q is negatory, so you have K, that's positive, a negative charge, and then R, that's positive, R is always positive. So the quotient is negative. So it's gonna go zoop, way down deep in the negatives, okay? And, and that signifies, so if, you have a, so if you have an electron, the potential, uh, the electrostatic potential of an electron it wants to suck protons in. Protons are going to go down into the bottom of that potential. Right? They're going to get attracted to the electron. But if you have a proton, K, po uh, positive K, positive Q, positive R, that potential, the closer you get to zero, it's going to go this way, and your proton's not going to be able to get too close to that. All right, so it's, as I said, it, the, the electron... Uh, the, the whole idea of voltage and potential is an abstraction, but it ends up being uh, the thing to, uh, to study when you're talking about circuits. So that's one of the reasons we're studying it. Here's another um, thing. That, there's a nifty um, energy unit that's handy on atomic and molecular scales, and it's called the electron volt. It's basically uh, one volt, the number of joules that you get when one electron or one positron, or excuse me, one electron or one proton moves through, you know, one volt of potential difference. So if you're two, you know, like the two circles that we had, if there was one volt of difference between those two circles and an electron or a proton went either way, the plus or minus um, of the energy, the change in the energy would be one electron volt. And it just so happens that the ground state uh, of the hydrogen atom is about 13 point si negative 13.6 electron volts. So electron volt, it's 1.602 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. Right, it's a pretty small number for us, but for atoms, it's the perfect number. So electron volt is what we use for atomic and molecular physics. I mean, if we're talking about energy. So if you're talking about mass or something, you have other units. But for energy, yeah, that's what we got. Okay, so it's basically E times 1 volt. And so that's, oh, oh, I forgot to put my superscript there. It should be 10 to the superscript minus 19 coulombs <laughs> times 1 joule per coulomb. So that's why it's equal to this 1.602.
And notice here that I just have the, the positive value of, you know, E is the, fun, we, we call it the fundamental charge. That's, you know, it's the charge of a proton. The negative of that is the charge of the electron. All right, now what we're gonna do is work on the parallel plate capacitor after the break. So let's take a five minute break and then we'll do some document cam. Uh, if you want to get your homework and you didn't get it, let's let's do that right now. Actually, last name. Spell it. Oh. Sanchez? Okay. Webb. I hate that thing slamming like that. Molly. Okay, here you go. Brown. Here you go. Ooh, you got 10 points. Good. Yeah, you were a little slow getting up here. That's all right. We got you now. It's the main thing. We got you now. Here it is. Oh, yeah. You're on top. McDaniels. Yeah, I was giving out your paper. Here it is. Here you go. Uh, T I N. All right, there we go. Okay. What? Okay. Yeah. Some of these are out of order, looks like. With a K. Is that it? Okay. Okay. This one? Oh, Tormos. Okay. With a T. Okay, there you go. Thank you. Alba Media Sosa. Alba Media Sosa. Sosa. I think we got it. There you go. Thank you. R. Wait a minute, is this, that's not. No. Is, is it everybody's or is this the pack that you bring? This is everybody's. Um, maybe it's under F. Because I have the one for S, maybe they go under F. Alright. Flores, is this it? Yeah. Oh, okay. There you go. Thank you. Okay. Okay, hold on a second. I gotta pause the podcast. So I don't record what you're about to say. Okay, let's get back to work. And uh, what we're going to talk about is uh, parallel plate capacitor. And have you ever seen this demonstration? This is called the Van de Graaff generator. You know, it's this this metal sphere. And it's got a bunch of belts running in it and it generates a lot of static charge and if it's really good conditions your hair stands on end like this here's another it's called the van de graaff generator and those 
see that kind of yellowish area down beneath the, the right, right down here? That is uh, a belt that's going up and down. And it's just friction. And the friction generates charge and then that uh, uh, translates to, or transfers over to the metal sphere. And if you put your hands on it, then you're developing high potential and your hair f you know, floats out into space. Except my hair doesn't float out into space because it's really curly, but you know, it, it's, it's always kind of amazing when it, when it gets. Now here's Van de Graaff himself, all right? This is like from the 1930s. And see, that's a fairly big one. And you know, I've seen, and if you've gone to a science museum, sometimes they have these things set up that are really big and they generate like huge lightning bolts. Now this thing would probably, that set there would probably generate some really nice sparks. You know, so like if you wanted to kill ants or something, you know, you know how like, I keep, I gotta be careful about that. You know, like when you're a little, you know, in your fifth grade and you get a magnifying glass and you fry ants on the sidewalk, just think what you could do with this. Of course, um, they, they make them even bigger than that. And I'll show you a picture of a, big, a really big one in a few minutes. Anyway, so those, um, those zappers, those uh, Van de Graaff generators, uh, you can store the energy from them in a capacitor, a parallel plate capacitor. And I've seen parallel capa plate capacitors store really huge, enough charge to kill somebody. And that, when I was in grad school, you know, we used to do these demonstrations and charge up a capacitor and then discharge it and, and try to get a, a good spark. And we, you really had to be careful because if you, if you got in the way, that spark would go through you. And that it's possible that some of the bigger ones that we had out there were, you know, could have killed you. So what is a parallel plate capacitor? It's, as you can maybe think, it's two parallel metal plates. Um, they're separated by air or uh, by maybe by an insulator of some kind, a little bit of plastic. Um, and then they're charged up equally, uh, plus Q on one plate and then minus Q on the other. You, know, you connect a battery, you know, put, you know, batteries from one end of a battery up to one plate and the batter wire from one, the other end of the battery up to the other plate and they charge up equally. And uh, they develop, because they're uh, parallel plates, and if it's, you know, if it's evenly built, I mean, it's, if, it's, if it's two plates of the same shape and size, and they're fairly close together, then you'll get even distribution uh, of charge, so the charge density per unit surface area, uh, symbol customarily used as sigma, um, you'll get that uh, quite nicely uh, through most of the uh, parallel plate. Uh, so uh, tomorrow uh, we're going to work on some simple circuits with capacitors, um, and so what we're going to do to for the rest of today on the document cam is work out some, uh, some parallel plate capacitor concepts that use the idea of voltage and use the idea of how do you charge up and store, you know, capacitor, that means, that comes from the word for capacity. You know, something that has a capacity means you could, you know, maybe store something in it. And that and it's not a it's not a coincidence that they use that term. It is a structure that you can use to uh, store electric charge and electrical energy. And we're gonna work that out. But before we do that, I want to show you a really big, nice Van de Graaff. See, this is a nice one. I mean, this would kill it. This would probably kill it. A mule, if you if you knew how to do it. If, if you figured it out. But this, oh my goodness. See these two little guys down here? Yeah, those are. And see, we still use Van de Graaff generators. We use them to, they're accelerators. 
they'll accelerate charged particles. You know, protons, electrons, ions. You know, uh, one of the things that we do is we take a gold nucleus, we strip as many of the electrons off as we can, and we slam, the, slam t two gold nuclei together at high, ultra high speed, you know, like a good fraction of the speed of light, and when they collide, for just a, a blink of an eye, the nuclei, uh, the two gold nuclei, are so hot, it simulates the conditions of the Big Bang at the very beginning of history, the ultra high temperatures of the Big Bang. Uh, so yeah, they do it with big uh, stuff like this and other devices. Okay, uh, let me pause the uh, podcast or the uh, YouTube here. Let me get my cursor back. Come on, cursor. Here we go.